Well, good morning, everyone. Just wanted you to know that this clock here on my pulpit, which I never pay attention to, is now officially broken. <laughs> Laura told me, she goes, you know, the clock isn't working. I'm like, did it ever matter? I don't even know why they put it there. <laughs> <laughs> Wishful thinking. <laughs> um, so glad that you're here. And for those who are watching online, we are grateful for your participation. Um, and uh, what was I going to say? Oh, I wanted to ask a question about the music. Okay? Because, you know, I'm not a very smart person. So when you have the song and the lyrics there, and then some are in, you know, like, which part am I supposed to sing? Because I didn't want to, I mean, it's like a teleprompter. I'm like, I don't want to be like a politician where I read, in quotations. I mean, you should tell us, I mean, is there a part that you guys sing, and then the part that we sing, or... You just proved a point. <laughs> okay, that's, I mean, the, the song's beautiful, but I was just like, I'm stuck. What part do I sing? And then you have pauses, and I'm like, I'm not ready for a pause. There should be something there that says pause, because I'm going to keep singing, you know? I know why teleprompters are there. You need it. I was so blessed this week because Brad Batters took me fishing down at the coast for three days in the water. And some of the times, I was actually standing up. It's, it was crazy. We, we go out and we wade, and then we, we're, we're casting. The first day I get out there, we're having a blast. I mean, it's hot, but who cares? Brad caught two fish. I caught a bird. <laughs> Brad is a great fisherman. I mean, even when the fishing is bad, he catches something. But here I am reeling in this bird like, can't you just leave me alone? How am I going to explain this one? And then I... Then we, we did actually catch quite a bit of fish, and it was, it was a great time. But I started thinking about it. The cost of the reels that I ruined, I mean, I cast one time, and the, the top half of the pole went flying. I'm like, this takes talent. And Brad's like, how'd you do that? I go, I think the pole was cheap from Walmart or something. Why did you give me the Walmart pole? <laughs> poor, poor Brad. Then, and, you know, I mean, just made a mess of the whole thing. So I'm out there feeling pretty good about myself. And Brad says, go over there by that grass. You'll catch some trout. Well, you knew a person with me with no feeling in their feet. And I had these, you know, water shoes on. I fell immediately, and there I went, and then I popped up, and there I went again, and I popped up. And Brad says, you know, you're attracting sharks. <laughs> I'm like, now I know why you brought me. I don't know. We had a great time. It's just like you get out there, and you're sitting on the boat, and even if you're not catching a lot of fish, just... You, you just can't help but worship. Amen. Yeah. The majesty of all of God's creation and then being out on the water, mm -hmm. it's just, it was amazing. Thank you, Brad. Although, I will say, if you are cost conscious, it's probably cheaper to go to HEB and just buy the fish. <laughs> you know what I mean? I was thinking, by the time you pay for the bait and the gasoline, and the repairs to the rods, <laughs> and, and all that, you probably could have bought 10 times as much fish. 
but you would have missed the opportunity to be out of the water with your friend. And I met one of Brad's other friends, John. He's a great guy. Awesome. Last statement to me was, Preacher, I love Jesus. I just cuss a little bit. <laughs> I said, you know, I know quite a few people like that. <laughs> Anyways, we had, a, we had a wonderful time, and I, I'm very grateful, Brad, for you taking me down there. It was refreshing. Hebrews, well, it, and then I forgot to tell you about how to get back in the boat. So if you don't know, I have Parkinson's, and sometimes what happens is, is my legs don't work. And I'm trying to step into the boat, and my leg would not climb up on the ladder. And then poor Brad's like, grab my wrist, we'll pull you in. I'm like, how about if you just pull me high enough so I can sit down here for about 20 minutes and recover? <laughs> I was so exhausted from standing up, falling down, standing up, falling down. <laughs> and in the meantime, still caught some fish, so it was an you know, overall good day. I got baptized by myself <laughs> 12 times in 10 minutes. <laughs> and then the last thing, I'm getting in the boat, Brad's trying to pull me up, and I have my prescription sunglasses on. He pulls me up, I fall backwards. My glasses went right to the bottom. So I dove down to grab him, and I could feel one thing, but then I ran out of air. And by then, the boat had drifted. And I went down, and I couldn't find anything but sand and rock. So the trip costs me, <laughs> but it's way better than owning the boat. So if you have a friend like Brad, don't buy yourself a boat. That is a sinkhole. I mean, I'm so, gra I'm so, I, I'm so grateful that Brad has that boat and he invited me. And the, engi the engine didn't... Did, did, should I tell him about how you drove over that rock? I don't know about, it was about time for us to go. I don't know. <laughs> we were sitting out there, and one of those big tankers came in. And it literally was like, went from high tide to low tide. And Brad redesigned his propeller on the rock underneath us. And I was like, oh, we're dead. We're going to be out here forever. But nope. Brad worked his magic. It's amazing, Brad. Amazing God. If you weren't here, I'd be making fun of you. You know that. <laughs> so, Hebrews chapter 10, we're in verse 19 today. The gospel. What is the gospel? Well, I mean, if you know the gospel, then you've gone through the series on the Romans Road of how to share the Romans Road about how wicked you all are and how um, if you don't want to go to hell, you have to pray this prayer or the four spiritual laws or something like that. And most of it doesn't sound like good news at all because it all depends on you. Now, if you grew up religious like I did, man, there was no good news. It was all, I mean... People would come up to me. They'd have the, the nerve to come up to me and say, are you a born-again Christian? Do you know, do you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? That was my favorite one. I'm like, no, I'm Catholic. And I don't want, I don't need to, you know, I'm scared. People say, are you going to go to heaven when you die? Nope. Sure thing, I am not going to heaven when I die. My hope is purgatory is a real thing. And I hope that there's at least a few people left behind to pray me out of there. That, that was my mental concept. I'm dating my wife in college. First date went great. So I thought, hey, why not try for two? He says, I can't go out with you. I'm like, Why? I'm thin, good looking, got cowboy boots, a motorcycle. What's not to like? She's like, you're not a Christian. I go, what a judgmental person she is. She must be a Baptist. She wasn't. I'm like, what do you mean I'm not a Christian? I'm a Catholic. 
How do you get more Christian than that? Oh, you don't understand. So, being the wise person that I am, cunning in every way, I said, how about if we go to church together? And she fell for it. <laughs> she takes me to church. I hear the gospel for the first time. And I went for it and I said, Jesus, I'm a sinner. I'm a mess. And I know I can't do anything to improve on this mess. Will you save me? Amen. And he did. I'm so glad she wasn't Mormon. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Is that bad? <laughs> no, I mean, I think... You know what made it good news for me? Was there was nothing I had to do but receive. Now, if you come and you think, okay, give me the rules that I need to follow in order to be received and accepted by Christ... That's not good news. It might, you might think it's good news because you think you're well-disciplined and can pull it off, but I know me well. If you gave me 10 rules to follow, you know which ones I would break? All 10? You can't put me in a room that says wet paint, don't touch. I've been at airports on those, you know, walkway things, and you'll see a sign, Wet paint, don't touch. And I'll be looking around like, why? I would never touch those dirty, filthy things. But they told me I couldn't. So I automatically wanted to. What was the problem? Me. I'm the problem. What's the solution? Jesus. And if you try to add anything to Jesus, you take away from it. And so he's been showing us that the gospel is a message far more, far deeper than just knowing you're forgiven of your sins. It's an invitation to a relationship of intimacy with the creator. This is, this is what makes it good news. You don't contribute, you receive, but you're invited to participate. Now, think about it. Knowing you the way you know you, aren't you in awe that God would say, I chose you, I chose you, and predetermined that you would be adopted as a beloved child of mine. And no success can improve upon it, and no failure can take away from it. That's why it's good news. And so he tells us that this one-time perfect sacrifice, last week, once for all. <laughs> Back in the day, we used to go to confession. How many people have ever been to confession? Yes, yeah, some of you know what I'm talking about. It, it's a great thing. I used to love it. I mean, it was. I don't know. I feel sorry for people who don't know the experience. You go in there, and you... No, I don't know what it's like now. But back in the day, the priest would go in, and there'd be probably two or three different priests in there. And you'd go in, and the light would shine. And then you'd go in one side, and someone else would go on the other side. And as soon as you knelt down, I guess there was a light in his room that tells you, and he'd slide the screen, and you'd say, Forgive me, Father, for I have sinned. And then you're supposed to tell him all the dirty stuff you've done. And I would usually, you know, maybe give a quarter... Because, you know, you know, they get to know your voice, and they know who you are. And the priest is the other day, heck no, is that you? There's got to be more coming than that. And then you say, you know, he'd absolve you of your sin, and then make you go say ten Hail Marys and four Our Fathers, and you were off the hook until the next week. And we'd have to go back. And here's what the good news is. he never got to go back. Because he says, I will... I'm dealing with you no more according to your transgressions or sins. That that one perfect sacrifice paid for all of your sins before you committed your first one. Well, what about the next one? Forgiven. Now, does that seem too, too good? 
Does it seem impossible? It's not because, you see, we live in an in a element of time where there's a 24-hour day and seven days a week and on average 30 days a month, right? 365 days a year and year after year we get older and older and Nancy, there's Nancy, she said she had to go to a birthday party and didn't want to go. And I wanted to say, amen. I don't want to go to a birthday party, especially for a one-year-old. Those are the worst. Who has birthday parties for one-year-olds? All of you people do this, and I'm like, oh, it's cruel and unusual punishment even if it's your own grandchild. I went to, the last one I went to, our son, I gave her credit for part of it, our son has two children, and they invite every kid from the school, so there's like 40 kids in the house, 20, 20 boys, each one with a sword, hatchet, or knife and 20 girls. Only one of them had a sword, one girl. And then they had this playhouse in the backyard with balls in it, you know, and a jumpy thing. Not a single parent was out there. I'm like, this doesn't seem like a wise place to be. All I could see was problems. So when they finally, I said, no knives, no hatchets, no anything in the jumpy zone. Trouble is coming. So when I'm there, I'm thinking, gosh, Lord, I hate birthday parties. Wait till they turn 21, then I'll come to that party. Just to supervise, make sure that nothing bad happens. Remember that, Susie, when you turned 21. Anyway, it was all about, you know, why I went? My wife made me. No. Um, relationship. You know, you say, hey, would you like to go to a birthday party? I'm like, no. But if you say someone I love and care about, I go, Why? Not because I'm a person who really likes parties, but because of relationship. And this is the goodness of God, that he desired a relationship with you. He forgave you, not just to forgive you, he forgave you so he could live in you. And so he says here, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Father, I pray that you would move in our hearts, that your spirit would stir us, to give us a, a revelation, an awakening, an understanding, open the eyes of our hearts and minds, Lord, to receive all that you have done for us. We pray in Jesus' name. Now, the reason this is important is if you think God is an accountant, you can't have a relationship with him. By that I mean, if God has a record of your sins, how do you have a relationship? In life, we read the chapter in Second Corinthians, the, what we call the love chapter. New brides, they love this. Love is patient. Love is kind. You know what the one I love the most? Love keeps no record of wrongs. Girls, would you take that one seriously? Because my wife has a memory that is impeccable. I can't remember anything. 
And you know what my daughter had the gall to say to me? She says, Dad, do you know why women remember and men don't? Because women care. And men are wrong. <laughs> and so they are incentivized to forget their sins. And I'm like, hmm, she might have a point. Listen, God says, I will remember your sins and transgressions no more. So I can be in relationship with God because he's not dealing with me according to my transgressions. I'm not saying I don't have any. The two that I have are very minor. The two that I remember. <laughs> anyway, let's go on. He says, therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy place. What was the holy place? In the temple, in the tabernacle, there was a section that was sealed off where the, the Ark of the Covenant was, and it was the holy of holy places. And the priest could only go in there once a year to make an offering for the sins of the people. So Jesus is saying, we have confidence to enter into the holy place. What is that holy place? It's you. He says, that one perfect sacrifice not only brought us forgiveness, but we who are the brethren have the incredible access to God. I spent most of my life thinking I needed a priest to go on my behalf to God because I wasn't worthy to go. I needed someone that, you know, they were a step above. Now, I used to pray to Mary, because the priest made us, right? Because Mary had better access to Jesus because, you know, you got to listen to your mother. But do you realize, friends, that no one has greater access to the living God than you do as a beloved child? That you can go to God and know that he hears you, not because you're good. You can go to God and know that he hears you because he's forgiven you and he put his life in you. You have access and you can have confidence to know that when you go, he hears you. The high priest, man, he was scared to go in there. He made an offering for himself. He took a bath of cleansing. And then he took another sacrifice and would go in there. And the teachings were that they would put a rope around his ankle so that if he sinned and was killed in the holy place, because there could be no sin in the holy place, they could drag him out. Because only the high priest could go in. Now, to me... It's kind of like, I was thinking on the, about this on the news the other day, that Israel is in this horrible battle, right? And they keep killing the top people. And then I thought, this poor guy who just got elected the new leader, I wouldn't want that job. <laughs> they already know where he lives, I'm sure. Well, would you want to be a high priest, knowing that if you entered into the holy place with any flaw, you might be killed? Friends, think about this. This is the incredible access that you have to God. You don't need another priest because he made you a priest. He tore down everything that was an obstacle to you being in a dynamic relationship with God. See, the gospel is more than just going to heaven. I, want it. I know I'm going to heaven because I'm already there, spiritually. And I can't wait to get to heaven because I'll have a glorified body there and I'll be able to beat Joel like off again. I thought, in my arrogance, that Joel would never even get close to me. But he has been empowered by the Holy Spirit to whoop my butt and golf almost every time. It's not fair. I think it's something to do with the surgery he did on my wrist. <laughs> it's just a theory. You know, if, if your best friend is also your orthopedic surgeon 
and competitive in golf. I think he just left it like something different. Anyways, he says, you have that direct access. Do you take advantage of it? Do you realize that there is nothing going on in your life that he doesn't care about? I was talking to a guy, one really super smart computer nerd guy one time sharing the gospel with him. I said, listen, in Christ, you can go to God with every single problem. When you have a problem here and you're trying to figure it out, don't trust your own intellect. Ask God to show you the way. He goes, well, I, I don't bother God with little things. There are no little things with God. God cares deeply about every single thing that you're dealing with. You worried about the future? You should be. Go to him. He says, I care about everything that you care about and more. That's the God that we have. It's not that we enter in self-confidence. We enter into uh, forsaken of self <clears throat> and enter in full confidence because we know who he has made us to be. And he's made it perfect. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20 are, says, Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? For you were bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. Listen, friends, we live in an idea that, that God is in a place far distant to us. But once you receive Christ, once you entrust yourself to him, he says, I redeem you. Which means, I bought you back. Have you ever had to pawn anything? I, I fortunately have never had to pawn anything. But in Asia, it's a big thing. <laughs> and they give you a redemption ticket. Which means... You take your, your gold and you say, here, I need to pawn this. You're not selling it. He gives you, he says, okay, I'll give you $100. And he gives you a redemption ticket. You take it back and you pay, in a month, $110 to redeem, to buy back what was yours. Now it belongs to you. The Bible tells us that each and every one of us were seeking after darkness, that we were doing the work of the enemy because he was our master, whether we realized it or not. People think, well, aren't there people out there that are good people? I say, haven't met one yet. Can people do good things? Yes, absolutely. But he says, I don't want you to just do good things. I want to make you good. How do I do that? I put my life in you. You become a temple. All over India, all over Sri Lanka, all the different places we go, they all have dozens, hundreds, thousands of temples. And those temples are holy places where they think some God lives. When actually the only thing that's there is a satanic power. But you know what God says? Emily's my temple. John's my temple. Brad is my temple. Why? Because he says, I bought you. You were guilty and I redeemed you and you are no longer your own. I bought you with a price. Now, sometimes I, the way I act, I think, man, you didn't get a very good deal. <laughs> Does Jesus have buyer's remorse? Have you ever had buyer's remorse? Come on, be honest with me. Anyone here ever have buyer's remorse? Yes. Me too. I remember I was in, still working in finance, and we had our son, Ryan, who was probably, what, a year old. And a salesman came to our door to sell me an encyclopedia set. 
It wasn't just any ordinary encyclopedia set. This is before internet. You guys, who would buy an encyclopedia set when you could Google it? I did. It was like $365. That was big money back then. And it came with regular updates. I bought it. The next day I thought, you know what? It's going to be a couple years before this kid can even read. Why did I spend that money? I had instant buyer's remorse. I told you the buyer's remorse I had a few weeks ago when my wife got that chair and I put it in the back of the truck and it flew out. I instantly had buyer's remorse because I didn't strap it down. And I knew it was a sin that would be take a long time for her to forget. But she forgot because I bought her a brand new couch. And now every time I spill something on it, she reminds me. I'm like, I didn't even sit there. She goes, <laughs> right. Anyway, he says, listen, I have made you the holy place because of the perfect sacrifice. That's what makes it good news. It, he, you don't make the sacrifice. Every other religion, even man-made interpreted religions of Christianity, always are calling on you to make a sacrifice. And he says, there is nothing you can do to improve on this sacrifice which makes you holy and accepted and a beloved child of God. So live there because he lives in you. You don't have to get in a meeting and pray out loud so he can hear you. He lives in you. He knows what's on your heart before you even speak it. But he desires intimacy with you. When you think of intimacy, you, th you, you, you know, we use that word in a different ways, but it, it's a bonding of knowledge. And he says, I want you to know me as the beloved so that you can come to me with everything. It's a beautiful bond that he has for us. And he was so forethinking, he said, I'm going to take away every obstacle to that intimacy. We have challenges and troubles and trials in this life, no doubt, but we never go through any of them alone. We were singing that one song about your, our daily bread. Has it ever been truer? I mean, literally, you go... Go to H-E-B, and you'll be praying for your daily bread. If you go to Costco and can walk out and not spend $500, it's a miracle. I, I walked out and I said, how did I just spend $500 in Costco? It's a trick. Nothing was over $50, but everything was close to $50. And you, you say, do I panic? No, I said, Lord, you have never not provided for me. And you might be looking ahead and said, how are we going to get through this? He is my provision. He is not distant to me. He is not unaware of my condition. He's not, aw he's not unaware of any trial that's before you. Totally aware. That's good news. Because if you don't have some problems right now, just wait a day. But understanding and awareness that you are that holy place changes the way that you live in the world. Because everywhere you go, God's there. John said, I love Jesus, but I cuss a little bit. <laughs> and I said, well, I guess God's heard it all. <laughs> And then Brad said, I never take the Lord's name in vain. And I said, well, good, because he hears it all. He sees it all. And now, I could twist that around and make you feel guilty about it, but I'm just saying to you, no, he loves you. So listen to him. 
hear him. He says, how did this all happen? By the blood of Jesus? Well, what do I do? Well, first, you write me a check personally for $40,000. And then I will pray for you to write me another check for $40,000 until I can build an empire. No. The blood of Jesus. Nothing else compares. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. When we go to communion and the Lord's Supper, we take that horrible tasting wafer. Somebody's got to do something about that. That is the nastiest wafer around. And then we take a little cup of sweet grape juice, unless it's been sitting in the heat for a while. And then it's, it gets better. <laughs> no. uh, and we take it, why? To remember it wasn't us, it was him. And this is the important part, it's in us. We don't look at it and throw it away. We take it and we eat it. We take the cup and we drink it. Why? To remind us that we have this great privilege of relationship and intimacy with Christ because of what he did, not because of what we do. Boldness to come before him. You see, sometimes if you live with guilt and shame, you can't come boldly. If you think that God has a list somewhere up in heaven of all of your transgressions, the ones that you know and the ones that you don't even remember, you can't come boldly. But he says, come boldly because of the blood of Jesus. Why? Because he says that blood took care of every sin, even the sins you haven't committed yet. Because he operates outside of that. That shouldn't make you say, oh, man, I, I guess I should go out and sin because I've been forgiven. No. Sin kills you. It's not about not being forgiven. Sin is a destructive, corrupting force in your life, even if you're a forgiven saint. That's why Paul said in Romans 6, should we go out and sin that grace may abound? He says, God forbid. Why? Sin hurts us. And that's why even though we can love people who are living in sin and practicing sin, we can't condone it because it's hurtful to them whether they understand it or not. My boldness has nothing to do with my own merit, my own works. It's only his shed blood. He made me acceptable. I don't know how many of you grew up, but how many of you felt affirmed and accepted by your father? Emily, Delane, a few of us. I never did. My dad was a good man hard-working businessman, but he grew up without a father. He didn't tell me he loved me until I was 50 years old. I don't think he told me he was proud of me until he was 70. Now, am I bitter about that? No, because we reconciled in the later years of his life, he came on missions trips with me. It was amazing to be able to lead my dad to the Lord in Sri Lanka one day. And we were tight right to the very end. But here's the deal. Maybe you didn't have that kind of a dad or a mom, but he's saying God the Father shed his blood to make you acceptable. And no one else's opinion matters. Doesn't that... I mean, I, I, I get, like, my body shakes with thrill the fact that it wasn't me, it was his blood. It's not what I bring, it's what he brought. And he says, you're loved and accepted. You're affirmed in every way. All by the Son. The blood secures for us the blessings and promises of the Son. 
Why did I spend so much time, even as a born-again Christian, asking God to give me what he already gave me? Lord, give me more power. Lord, give me, you know, come closer. These all sound like really good things to pray. Lord, come closer and be here. Be present with us. Lord, I need more favor, more blessings, more power, more... He's like, no, you just need to open your eyes and read what I already told you. That you have the very power of God that raised Jesus from the dead. And how did you get that power? The blood. Not by being good. Not by tithing. Certainly, if you've been in our circles, you've heard this one. God can't bless you if you don't tithe. That 10%, that 10% belongs to God. 90% is yours, 10% is God's. You don't give your tithe, I ain't going to come pray for you. How can I pray for someone who doesn't tithe? God can't bless someone who, who doesn't tithe. We all know that. Big time lie. Big time manipulation. You know the truth of it is? The tithe does not belong to God because Jesus is your tithe. And I'm sorry to tell you this, that 10% doesn't belong to God and 90% to you. I'm sorry. 100% of all that we are and all that we have belongs to God. Amen. And if he says live on 10 and give 90, then you live on 10 and give 90. Not by compulsion, not because some preacher manipulated you. Because you are in an intimate relationship with Christ. And you have no guilt. And no shame. And no condemnation. Why? The blood. He says... Um, to the praise of the glory of his grace by which he made us accepted in the beloved. You know, I don't know how important this is to other people, but some personalities, some of us, need to feel accepted. And I'm, a, I'm kind of a people person that doesn't really like people because I know them well. Does that make sense? <laughs> I used to really like people, and then I got to know them. <laughs> My wife says, you shouldn't say stuff like that. People will think it's true. I go, it is true. <laughs> no, I'm serious. I, like one time in one of my pious moments, you know, I come out of my office, my prayer closet, and I've pray, been praying, and I said, you know, honey, I just want to love people. I just want to learn to love people, really love people. And she goes, in her typical kind and way, she says, no, you just want people to love you. And I said, ouch. Ooh. Oh, that hurts. I better call 911. I think I'm having a heart attack. She told me the truth again. You know, there's nothing like a wife. Because wives know you better than anybody else. And I do want to love people. But she knew what I really needed. I needed people to love me. I wanted to be accepted. I wanted to feel like I had done enough. And God's saying, you know what? You can't do more than what I've done for you to be accepted. And it's all by what? Grace. So if I can live as one who's accepted, then I don't need acceptance from anyone else. It's nice, but I don't have to have it. You try and go and find acceptance in this world, and that's a roller coaster. He says, by the new and living way that opened for us through the curtain. You remember when Christ is on the cross, right? And he says, it is 90% done. 10% left for you guys to pull it off. No, what did he say? It is finished. What happened? 
the veil was torn from top to bottom. Why? So that where before no one could enter into the presence of God, it was available to all mankind. Available to everyone to receive. Will everyone receive it? No, unfortunately. But I wish they would. He opened it. He was the newly slain, perfect sacrifice. But Jesus, in his death, didn't only conquer death, he gave us the way to life. Right? He says, he who has a son has life. If you don't have the son, you don't have life. You remain in death by choice. He says in John 14, 6, Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. A better way of understanding that verse, I think, is to say this. You want to know God as your Abba? You want to know God as your daddy, your papa? Only through Jesus. Because someone might say, oh, I, I, I believe in God. Whatever that is. And I said, you know what? The devil believes in God too. But do you know him intimately as your daddy? It's through Jesus. And that one time perfect second. He says that is through his flesh. So Christ, fully God and fully human, which is a hard concept for us to grasp, has opened and renewed and consecrated. He tore down the veil so that we could have intimate relationship with him. We can come boldly before him. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, he is Lord over the house. It is in his headship, in his lordship, his authority in view. Over who? Who's the house? Are we the house? Is this church building... Is our little cute church building uh, the house of God? No. no. Well, what, it should be because we have a big cross out there. That should identify us as the house of God, right? Don't you love that cross? I love that cross. It's a great cross. Especially if you're getting married and you get pictures taken in front of it. It changes everything. Those marriages last at least six months longer. <laughs> Just kidding. No, I love it. But that doesn't make it a house of God. I'm looking at the house of God. You are the house of God. Because he lives in you. You are his temple. Tell me that doesn't change things. The awareness of what he's done for us changes the behaviors that legalism tries to change but can't do it. Because the law doesn't empower us to do the will of the Father. Grace does. His indwelling life, connecting back to that, and with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. He said, listen, I've justified you and sanctified you by the blood. Has anyone here ever tried to make themselves holy? No? Just me? We had a whole movement called the holiness movement. Anybody know about that? You never heard of the holiness movement? You sinner. <laughs> you worldly, ungodly sinner. No, and we had a whole movement called the holiness movement. You know, didn't stay in that one long because women weren't allowed to wear makeup. No, I'm serious. This is true. Look it up on the internet. If it's on the internet, it's true. The holiness movement, you, women couldn't wear makeup or jewelry. They had to wear dresses. They had to have the same hairstyle. And I'm like, man, if the barn needs painting, paint it. Sorry. I don't know where 
That's not in the notes. <laughs> it's just something that slipped out of my mouth. Um, <laughs> sorry. I apologize in advance. <laughs> So if you try to make yourself holy, what happens? You not only fail, you put all the focus on who? You. And then what kind of conscience do you have? Guilty. Do you know why you have a guilty conscience? Because you're guilty. <laughs> Seriously, friends, why do people think that church is the place that the good people go to get more gooder? It's not. The church building is the place where the guilty people come to know that they've been redeemed and bought with a price and sanctified, set apart to God and clean. I can go forward with a clean conscience, not because I'm always right and do the right thing all the time. I have a clean conscience because I know the blood of Christ has cleansed me. The blood of Christ has sprinkled my conscience clear. Just like in the Old Testament pictures, they would, the priest would take the, the blood of the one goat and he would sprinkle it on the scapegoat and they would take it out into the wilderness. Because you're, you can live with a clean conscience. You can have boldness to come into the presence of God because of that blood. Because Jesus cleanses us from all sins so that we are no longer to be a sin-conscious people. To be a Christ-conscious people. Focus only on him. Titus 3.5 says, He saved us not because of the works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and the renewal of the Holy Spirit. So, he did this one-time work, and he cleanses us, and then he puts the Holy Spirit in you to continually keep it going. To renew you, to remind you of what is true. So, Bringing it all together. Intimacy with God. Religion won't give you intimacy with God. Whatever you call it. God will always be distant to you in religion. In legalism. Why? Because religion makes you sin conscious. What I'm inviting you to is a gospel that says, Finished. A gospel that says God is no longer dealing with you according to your sins and transgressions. He has removed them from you through a perfect sacrifice and placed them, if you will, metaphorically in the deepest part of the sea, as far as the east is from the west. He's taken that which was dirty, filthy, sinful, and cleansed you. And all you have to do is say, yes, Lord, I receive this gift. I am no longer my own. I'm yours. Thank you. Give me your life. It's a great trade for us. Because he's our high priest. He's in there <laughs> sitting at the right hand of the Father making constant intercession which means, for some of us, he's doing a lot of talking. <laughs> some of us, he's saying, Lord, heck no, he's in me. He's in me. That's done. He's in me. That's the only intercession there is. It's covered by the blood. Perfect. Look at that guy. He's clean. Now, what he just did there, I will deal with. Yeah, he loves me enough. To, he loves me enough to spank me, if that's what I need. He loves me enough to train me and develop me and and grow me. He loves me that much. He's not going to let me walk away in in constant sin and rebellion and not deal with me, 
or I'm not a child. But it's not punishment, it's love. We have confidence, boldness to come to God through faith in Him alone. Do you have that? Have you been practicing that? Live as a beloved child of God. You may have a lot of questions say, Lord, why is this going on? I, I don't have the answer for you, but Jesus does. I know that ten Hail Marys and five Our Fathers aren't going to do anything about your sin. There is no penance, if you will. I think that's what we used to call it. There's no penance that can deal with your sin. Only the blood of Jesus. So if you're here this morning and you don't know what it is to be forgiven or to be a born-again Christian, here it is. You see your own guilt and need of a Savior. And you say, yep, I believe that when Jesus went to that cross, he went to take all of my sin. It's all nailed there. And he went to the grave to leave it all behind. And on the third day, by his own power, he rose again so that he could not only forgive me, but give me resurrection, life, and power now. So that I can call him my papa. The one who knows me, loves me, accepts me, and is proud of me. God wants that for every one of you. Everyone who watches online, he wants that for you. He wants you to walk in that delight, that joy, every day. And no matter what you're facing, you say, Papa, I'm not liking this very much. <laughs> I'll just be, I'll be honest with you. I was in the, trying to get into that boat that second day. I was exhausted. I couldn't get my legs to work. And I said, I said, Jesus, I can't get in this boat. And I hate that my feet don't work. But I need you right now. And fortunately, Brad was strengthened by the Holy Spirit <laughs> to be able to lift this fat butt up and sit on the stool. And I sat there a long time catching my breath. I don't know what you're facing. But I know God is with you and he's going to bring you through it. And you may not understand why, but you can always say, thank you, Jesus, that I have this beautiful promise. I can come to you and know that you hear me. And even when I blow it, you don't ignore me. You hear it, and you're there, and you will never leave me. You will never forsake me. That sound like good news to you? Yes. Well, that was enough amens for me to stop, okay? Because you guys know how it is. You don't answer me. I'll keep going. You want the, preach you want the sermon to be shorter, Brad? Yeah. Be louder with the amens and affirming. Because then, I'll, then I, I won't assume that you haven't gotten it yet. <laughs> hey, I love you folks. Let's pray. Father, I can't tell you in adequate words what your word does for me. And I thank you that you make it so clear it's not about me and what I do or don't do. It's all about what you did and what I've received. And at the same time, I want that to change how I walk in this world. I want it to change all of my priorities to be focused on you as my king, my lord, my groom, for the day you would call me to the wedding feast. And I let 
ask that you would make that true for everyone here. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so uh, what we're going to do now, I'm going to ask you to stand. And we have three stations to celebrate communion. One in each of the foyers and one out in the um, overflow room. And then about 15 minutes we'll have our going deeper period where you can ask any kind of questions that you might have. Father, I pray the richest of your blessings on these people. That they would not only hear, but receive the good news. The gospel of grace. The gospel that transforms us. And we thank you that you gave your life to us to empower our faithful obedience to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.